what I wanted to do is look at the idea of asylum as it exists. And the first point I'd want to make is that the instrumentalization, the weaponization of migration, we've talked about who is it that has instrumentalized it, who's used migration as a weapon. Um, Victor and Sabolch talked about various countries and governments using migration. The Weapons of Mass Migration was the book that um, Sabolch had referred to. Um, Todd talked about terrorists and terrorist organizations using migration as a tool. But there's a third group, and that is domestic organizations, domestic interests in the receiving countries that are basically post-national to be charitable or anti-national, to maybe be more accurate, um, that use migration as a kind of, and use asylum specifically, as a kind of crowbar to pry open the borders of the countries, the borders that they do not accept as legitimate. And so this really highlights the urgency of revisiting the very concept of asylum. Asylum as it is, exists now creates a right to enter a country that the citizens of that country have no right to reject. Uh, this is um, an inversion of the way immigration policy ought to be working and the way we think it does work, but it doesn't. Uh, last year was the 70th anniversary of the United Nations uh, Treaty relating to refugees. The convention, it's called the Convention Relating to the Status of Refugees. It was a post-World War II, beginning of the Cold War artifact. It dealt, was, it dealt with, it sought to deal with the immediate problem that existed in the wake of the Nazi and Soviet um, aggressions in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. The original convention, 1951, was confined to Europe. There was a corollary convention called the Protocol it's a, again, it's a treaty that expanded those rules to the whole rest of the world. President Truman did not sign the 1951 Refugee Convention precisely because it was a restriction. It introduced this concept, uh, a subversive concept, really, of restricting uh, American sovereignty. Uh, however, the 1967 follow-on, the corollary of it called the Protocol, was signed by President Johnson's administration in 1968. It was confirmed by the Senate in 1969. And then in 1980, it was formally incorporated into American law. It was, at the time, uh, a sideshow, almost. In other words, it was a minor matter. It was, there's only a little bit of an exaggeration to say that it was a uh, latter version of what the, uh, for those of you who know about diplomatic history, the Kellogg-Briand Pact in the 1920s outlawed war. That really worked out great. Um, but it was, it was mocked, even by the people who signed it, as an international kiss. Well, in a sense, the refugee, the, the uh, refugee protocol, when the United States signed it, was in fact kind of seen almost as an international kiss. It only applied to a handful of people. At that point, the immediate aftermath of World War II had obviously passed. So it was basically for Russian ballerinas who were defecting. That was, that was kind of what it was. And in the 1970s, in the United States, before we formally put the um, provisions into our law in 1980, in the 1970s, we had an average of two or 3,000 asylum applications a year. So that's more than the occasional Russian ballerina, but not much more. It was not considered a, 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 an issue to really be worried about. Well, as Art pointed out, we're now talking about hundreds of thousands of people using asylum as a way of getting to the United States. It's choking our immigration courts. The same thing is happening in Europe. This is because we live in a completely different context. The world has changed. Communications and transportation has become rapid and much simpler and easier. Um, there's been a, a complete inversion of the um, population relationship between the kinds of places that would send people who were asylum seekers now have ballooned in population. The places that people want to go to now make a much smaller share of global population. 
Europe is obviously going to be facing this problem in a dramatic way. It's sitting on top of Africa, which is going to have 4 billion people at the end of this century. Um, and there obviously are regulatory tweaks that can be made. Um, uh, Christoph talked about some of the changes, you know, not only the Dublin regulation, but then things that are tightening up on that. Um, Art talked about the, the changes we're making going in the other direction, but there were, in fact, ways, there were methods that we had used in the U.S. to tighten up on immigration. Some were on the asylum issue. Some were passed in the 1996 immigration law, which tightened up immigration across the board, but also in the prior administration. Uh, the Attorney General um, established some new precedents for what qualifies for asylum, what doesn't. So that there are various regulatory ways of tightening the system. The problem is that those can always be changed and will be changed, as we've seen from one administration to another, a kind of ping-ponging of policy where the Biden administration has sought to pretty much undo everything the previous administration did, including, as Art laid out, a dramatic expansion and loosening of asylum. So my, my contention is that this cannot, there's no way for the developed world to regain control of its borders without scrapping the entire uh, asylum system as we have it. The, Refugee convention and protocol are um, anachronisms. They were, uh, the, the, the treaty, the original treaty, the convention was uh, signed a lifetime ago. The world has utterly changed. And we need it, if either an entirely new international legal structure for dealing with asylum or arguably um, dispensing with it altogether and returning it to um, individual nations deciding on how they're going to deal with this issue of asylum if they want to or not. For instance, the Refugee Convention, Article 31 of the treaty, says that an illegal immigrant has to be considered for asylum so long as he has come directly from the country where he is experiencing the persecution. Well, that's often does not happen. That's what asylum shopping is about. At our border, we have people from Haiti who lived in Chile and then crossed through, I'm not even sure, I'd look at a map, uh, 12 different countries to get to the United States. They weren't being persecuted. No Haitian in Chile was being persecuted in Chile, nor in Peru, nor in Ecuador, nor in Colombia, if I'm getting my map right, let me, nor in Panama, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, maybe Honduras, Guatemala, and Mexico. Well, the Refugee Convention does not mandate that that person be considered for asylum because he has not come directly from the country of his persecution, and yet that's the way our law does it. That's the way our law deals with it. Nonetheless, it seems to me in international law, forum shopping has to be prohibited, has to be made illegal, at least in domestic law, arguably in international law. Likewise, uh, the definition of persecution, I think, needs to be dramatically narrowed so that past persecution should not count. I mean, if the idea of sending someone back home, the, obviously the fear is, well, that they're going to be locked up, they're going to be killed, whatever it is. Well, that's a real issue. That's something we should consider. But if it happened in the past and there isn't, it isn't likely to happen in the future, the regime has changed, what have you, there's, that should not be a basis. This literally should not be a basis for persecution for an asylum grant. Um, as Art suggested, the likelihood of that persecution, the bar is set pretty low. I don't think 10% is written in the law, but, but, it's, but that's, it's that, in other words, it's a very low likelihood. Well, sorry, but if we are going to surrender sovereignty, which is what asylum represents, it is a surrender of sovereignty, the likelihood of persecution must be much higher than simply and sort of offhand 10% likelihood of it. The Supreme Court did say. Okay, they actually said yeah. 10%. Okay, well, um, it's not still not really law, but I guess it is now because whatever the judges say uh, somehow turns into law. But the basic point is, to finish up and we'll take questions, is that asylum policy needs to be made in the national interest. It cannot be a rights issue. 
moving from one sovereign state to another needs to be an issue of privilege, where the receiving state has complete authority to say no. Politically, they can set up whatever arrangement they want, but it has to be a matter up to the um, people who live in that country. And this is especially true in self-government, because what asylum represents is a kind of subversion of self-government, because the people of the United States or of any European democracy under current international arrangements do not have the right to say no to certain people, and that cannot be allowed to persist. We were able to live with that for many years because it simply wasn't a challenge. It was never really, we were never faced with the consequences of it. Now we are, and um, we need to return admission to our respective countries as purely a privilege that we grant, not as a right that people exercise against us.